What's in a thought? Just a thought. A lot more than most of us would imagine. When you have a thought, when I have a thought, you know what takes place? Immediately there is triggered in your brain and in my brain an electrochemical response that surges throughout our body and electrical magnetic waves goes through every part of your being and every part of my being because it's all linked up together when we have a single thought. In fact, when you and I have a single thought, over 500 billion reactions take place just that instant with one thought. Now, we've identified only about 2,000 of those reactions, but that's how magnificently we are constructed. And if we could hear these chemical waves and these electric waves as they go through our body with every thought, I think you would hear a mighty symphony being played. A thought, a single thought. In other words, it's almost like your brain and my brain is a kind of laboratory. And when we have a single thought in your brain and in my brain, chemicals are given off and electrical impulses are given off that affect everything about you and everything about me just with a single thought. Single thought. I have a little book someone gave me entitled, Who Switched Off My Brain? The author of this book says it's so important how our brain functions and what we think about. This author says that 87% of all physical and mental illnesses stem and originate with our thoughts. 87%. And her thesis, the author of this book, she says there's only 13% of your illness and my illness, physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, etc., comes from our environment, from the food we eat, or from our DNA makeup. Now, I would debate with that study. I think you could reverse it and say, well, what we eat and our environment and our DNA affects our health, and therefore that affects our thought process. So I think it's like arguing the chicken and the egg. Which is more important, the body to wholeness and health or the mind to wholeness and health? And I don't think anybody knows. The returns are not in. The truth is we know more about how Saturn relates to Mars way out there in the ionosphere then we know of how your brain and my brain relates to our bodies. We still don't know very much about that. But we do know they are tied together. We know they are united, mind and body. And we've discovered that in marriage, it is the whole body and the whole life of a person engaging with someone of the opposite sex in marriage, and it takes place with a whole life and the whole body of the other person. You can't just have body to body. You have also have to have life to life. Life to life, body to body is marriage. Body to body is adultery outside of marriage. And by the way, unless someone gets too pious here, you need to understand that every one of us here have broken every one of the commandments. Anybody want to debate that? That's what Jesus said. He took it away just from the physical act and said, in our minds, in our minds, we break this commandment. And he says, if we don't clean up our minds, we need to take radical action. It's pretty radical to punch out one eye, isn't it? To cut off one hand. He did not mean that literally. He was saying there are things we have to run from. We have to cut out of our lives in order to be pure, in order to have marriages that grow and sizzle that are relevant and practical for this 21st century. 
And so we're talking about adultery. There is mental adultery. There is physical adultery. And the physical adultery is deadlier. We can't really rank sin, though mental adultery is also deadly. But physical adultery plays back into your body and into my body when we commit physical adultery. That's what Paul says, see? That's what Paul says. It it affects who you are inside more than any other sin sexual immorality does. To show you how serious it is, there was a group of women, when their kids got in school, they decided they would study French. And so 11 women got in a French class together, and they were one day at a meal, and one of the women, they got close, and they would share their thoughts and share a little extra, extracurricular activity with the other women. And, and, they were, and one woman said, well, how many of us, 11 of them, how many of you women have been faithful to your marriage, faithful to your husband, all the time you've been married? And one hand went up out of 11. Now, a woman went home and told her husband, said we were eating together and, and named the woman who asked how many have been faithful and said only one hand went up. And she said, that wasn't my hand. And her husband said, what? You've been unfaithful? She said, oh, no, I haven't been unfaithful, but I didn't raise my hand. And her husband said, well, why didn't you raise your hand? And she said, I was ashamed. That's like being ashamed that when there's a flu epidemic, you don't have the flu. This is our world. And there's so many kinds of deadly affairs. Look up there. I wanted you to see all the kind of affairs. We put some names. This is not original with me. Some names of of affairs. There's the friendship affair, self-explanatory. There's the office affair. There's be a good neighbor affair. There's a cup of coffee affair. There's a seize the moment affair. There's... The people helper affair. There's the old acquaintance affair. Stop right there for a minute. We have a counseling service in our church you may or may not know about. We have 12 psychotherapists, godly men and tra- men and women, Christians who, who work in counseling. And they tell me that there is an epidemic of affairs that start with Facebook. They start online. Someone runs down someone they went to college, they went to high school with, someone they used to know in their hometown. They begin to talk and they they exchange pictures with them and they may even show it to their mate, but said this has led to so much immorality you wouldn't believe it. In fact, there's a lawyer's group that specializes in divorce and they just came out with this statistic, said 81% of those who are trying to prove infidelity in their marriage have used Facebook and the correspondence that took on there. Therefore, in our counseling, you know what we say to every married person? Get off Facebook. Get out of all this junk because it leads you astray. It's happening over and over again in our culture. (laughs) Another kind of affair. That's the old acquaintance. The same interest affair. You know, we like the same things. We're so lucky. Uh, the Western affair, let me stop explaining that one. <laughs> the Western affair is like, you know, the, 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 the guy who puts a notch in his gun every time he kills somebody, the old Westerns. Well, there's some men who put notches in their belt every time they sleep with a woman. Oh, yeah, very prominent in our culture, sure. And then the last one, the pornographic affair, primarily men, some women. Did you know that is an epidemic in America? Listen carefully. The seventh largest business in the United States is pornography. And some believe it is the most profitable business in America today. And it touches Christians especially, all of us, but Christians especially because it is pleasurable and it is secret. And we have the idea that it doesn't hurt anybody, forgetting that pornography is an adulterous, 
endeavor that rips out your soul and will destroy the heart of your marriage, your Christian witness, and affect you and your family for years and years and years to come. It is highly addictive. What we hear, what we see, and it is a devastating, devastating habit and a deadly habit. We have hundreds of men right now in our church, in support groups, who are crying out for help, saying it's taken the very life and vitality out of them. As young boys, it was masturbation, and now it moves into pornography in another area, and it is deadly, gentlemen. Don't think there's no harm, no foul. That It affects the deepest part of your soul. Let's look at the three major causes. These are big categories. There, there, are, there are hundreds of causes of adultery, but I, I put them under three big categories. I think you could put all the other causes as subsets under this. Look out on your screen. First of all, undeveloped emotion, undeveloped emotions. If you marry somebody who's still adolescent, if you marry somebody like that, that that's a setup for adultery. By the way, these causes doesn't mean, well, oh, I have a license for adultery. Don't, don't, make it, don't make that mistake. I'm not saying that. Mainly. I am saying these are general causes, general realms for adultery. So undeveloped emotions, adolescent. What's an adolescent? Best definition I've ever heard, adolescent is someone who's split right in the middle. Someone on this side is an adult, on that side is a child. Teenagers, right? One minute a teenage girl will make a decision, you'll say, I'm so proud of her. She's made a big time adult decision. And the next hour she'll make a decision, say, you know, she acts like she's nine years old. That's an adolescent. And a lot of us have married adolescents. A lot of people marry adolescents. They've still got these emotional holes. All of us are not totally mature. I understand that. But some people are really, really immature in so many, many areas. For example, the area of being spoiled. If you married somebody else, their mom and dad, they just, the, the sun would rise and set on that son and daughter. Boy, I'm going to give them anything and everything, and I want to provide for them and have the things I didn't have, and they're totally spoiled. If you married someone like that and they've had a token of success in life, that, that's a setup. They're, they're a setup. For somebody who says, well, I deserve this. I, I, I work hard, and, and, and I am successful. I, I'm thinking of, of a couple, and he, he slept with a lot of kids when he was in high school, and he, he married this beautiful, wonderful girl, and they joined the church, and they had a couple of children. After about three years, he began to sleep around and go here and go there at meetings, and he became an adulterer. And finally, it was discovered. And they asked him why. And in a counseling environment, he said, you know, is it problem with the kids? We got great kids. Problem with your wife? Oh, no, I love her. We have wonderful uh, love relationship together. Is it problem with your job? Oh, no, I'm doing fine there. Is it problem? No, no, everything was great. Well, then why do you, why are you unfaithful? And he finally said, well, I guess it's that forbidden fruit thing. Know about the forbidden fruit thing? Here's Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They had, God said, you can eat of the fruit of the trees of all these gardens, all these trees, thousands of trees. Man, isn't that enough for you, Adam? Except one, just one. Out of all the trees on the planet in a pristine environment, only one tree you can't eat out of, Adam. Oh, just that one? It's the forbidden fruit thing. Remember Candid Camera? Some of us remember that. Remember they'd, sometime they'd ha walk down the street, and one, they had a wall there, and they had a big hole there, and it says, don't look through this hole. <laughs> and they took pictures of the people who walked by. Well, normally you wouldn't look through the hole, but the, don't. And they would look. Uh, the other day in, in the hall of the church, they painted, and they put up a sign, wet paint. And I walked by in the morning, wet paint, and I came back by about an hour later, and it was still up, and I said, you know, 
I wonder if that paint's dried. <laughs> it had dried. <laughs> There's something about prohibitions, isn't it? That, that's like kids, teenagers, adolescents. Don't you smoke? Well, you get a chance to smoke, and, and you know, you, well, you know, you're going to do it. Paul Tyranay, the psychotherapist, said that children begin to grow up when they begin to do things in secret, not necessarily bad, secret from their parents, when they begin to have things they don't tell their parents, like a little girl. The parents said, now, when you go and walk across the street, make sure you walk on this side and not on that side. But her friend took her, and she walked on the street on that side, and she didn't tell her parents. See, that's a part of Growing up, that's childishness. And a lot of people in marriages are still adolescents. Oh, I, I can't do that. That's wrong. Oh, it has unusual appeal as they begin to play that pornograph in your mind and you play it out in reality and have some rationalization. Well, my marriage isn't all that I thought it was going to be. You married a kid, an adolescent. Look at the next one. Unresolved conflict. You know, in a lot of families, the way conflict is handled, usually the male, they just, I'm not going to argue. I'm through. You know, we just go into our cocoon. We go into our shell. We're not going to argue. Just go ahead. You have your problem. I'm not going to get with it. And a lot of marriages, when there's unresolved conflict, you know, they're in the ring together and they're boxing. And finally, the husband goes in his corner and the wife goes in her corner and they stay in their corner. You live your life. I live my life, and they never do really relate until they come in the middle of the ring, exchange a few bowls now and then, then they go back in their corner. Am I speaking to anybody? What should happen? 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, we are reconciled with God. Jesus Christ gets you and me right with God. Isn't that terrific? And therefore, because we get right with God, then we are to be in the business of reconciliation. What needs to happen to this man or woman in the corner? They need to say, oh, God, revive my marriage, my heart. And they need to see where their involvement in silence or whatever the situation and get right with God on their knees and then get up and go and walk in the middle of the ring. If necessary, walk on the other side of the ring and try to find mutual reconciliation. There'll be conflicts. We've got to know how to resolve those conflicts in marriage. And the way to do it is not to bury it and cover it up and push it down. This is what happens. And a way to handle some of these conflicts. What are the conflicts over? Children, money, sex, schedule. I mean... A lot of things, a lot of things conflict. And how do we avoid some of that? Ephesians 4, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Man, don't don't go to sleep until you begin to talk, begin to get your hearts and lives together. Now, you have to stay up late a lot of nights. Joe Beth and I have. Don't go to sleep. Don't let the sun go down your wrath. When you let the sun, your heart is bruised over a conflict. One mate is bruised. You sleep on it the next morning. That that bruised heart becomes a cold heart. You know how that is. You're nice, but you're just too nice. You know, cold. Don't look so pious. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Every married person here. It's a bruised heart. You spend the night with that, it becomes a cold heart. You stay with it a week or so, it becomes a hard heart. Now you've intensified the problem. You stay longer than that, it becomes an apathetic heart. By the way, when a couple comes and they're fighting and arguing, that's an encouragement. It's when they come and they're, they're apathetic. They say, you know, I don't really care. <laughs> I'm just, I don't, I don't have, it doesn't matter. Whatever she does, whatever he does, make no difference, huh? You see, that's when the Holy Spirit really has to do a work. So a lot of unresolved conflict when someone can be with someone else and and, and there's not conflict, no matter what the situation, and there can be intimacy there, there can be sharing there. All of a sudden, they end up in bed. It's because they go home and there's so much conflict there. You got to deal with it. Bring it out in the open. Turn the lights on. 
Third thing, unmet needs. Everybody has needs. Everybody has needs. The difference between the creator and the creature is needs. The creator, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are a a self-contained entity, the God is. The Godhead is self-contained. There is all there to give the fullness. God doesn't need anything. God is a self-contingent being. We are contingent beings as human beings. Though we made the image of God, we all have needs. A, a, a newborn babe has more needs than any other animal, remember, on this earth. A baby needs a longer time of care than any other animal. And when that child is growing, the little girl says, did I do good, Mom? You did good, Sarah. Dad, w- 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 I'm sorry. Will you? Oh, it's all right, Billy. We, they need support. And they have needs, all kinds of physical, emotional needs. We have to be there to hug and to help and to counsel and to laugh and to tease and to discipline. All those needs. When we grow up, do we have needs no longer? Certainly we have needs. Certainly we have needs. And we need appreciation. Wives, I want you to listen to me. You need appreciation, but your husband, men, need about five times more appreciation than women. I don't know why. We're just a weaker sex. We are. Gentlemen, we need more appreciation than women. Not that we shouldn't appreciate and admire women. Certainly that's a part of meeting their need. But men really need it. And when they come and see like it's only, man, what I can get out of you, what I want you to do, how you want. Also, in your wife or your husband, accept them the way they are. I thought for years I married the only woman in the world that couldn't be trained. (laughs) We've got to quit trying to train them, men and women, men and women. Accept them. And that leads people into affairs because the mate is not accepting them, warts and all. And know that God will continue to do a work with them. God's not finished with them. He's not finished with you or me. It has to be accepted. And there has to be affection. Genuine affection with one another. So, so this is the unmet needs that are there. And if these needs are not met, it sets anybody up for somebody else to come in and to destroy and to undercut, undercut that relationship. I want to say two things. I want to say these two things as dogmatically, as simply, but as powerfully as I can state them. Two things. Write it and steal in your heart and your mind. I'm not going to stumble. I want to say simply two things to everybody here. Number one, adultery is a cosmic sin because someone who destroys the trust in a marriage and the commitment of a marriage one time, ten times, or whatever, you have committed a cosmic sin, and you're saying that your pleasure or this moment in time goes against everything God has taught and everything God holds sacred. Adultery is a cosmic sin. It's no little picadillo or a little casual kind of liaison. Not at all. It's a cosmic sin. Number two, adultery is not the unpardonable sin. Isn't that terrific? We've got to clean up our mind. There's that mental adultery. Some have to clean up their whole bodies. There is that physical adultery. But God is in the cleansing business. If we confess our sin, he is able and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us of all the trash, including adultery in our lives. That's the grace of God. Adultery is a cosmic sin, but is not the unpardonable sin. And the Bible says about sexual sin, run. Don't tarry. Don't explain away. Don't back off a little bit. Run. Get out of there. Flee. That's what Joseph did. 
That's what Paul told Timothy to do, and that's what we have to do. You don't cut back, cut down, wean myself off of whatever this is and whatever relationship is there, whether it's mental or physical. Cut and run. Take no prisoners. Get out of there. And you'll be amazed a day or two or three, and it's one day at a time, God begins to set you free. If we had hymnals here, the old hymn books, you can find the theme in hymn after hymn. He breaks the power of canceled sin and sets the sinner free. Freedom, freedom, forgiveness, His grace. 